years ago, I needed a haircut, so I went to a hairdresser that I'd actually never been to before. And I sat there and uh, was chatting to uh, the hairdresser, and at one point she said to me, um, so, so what do you do? And I said, um, I'm a chemist. And she said, oh. So, um, okay. <laughs> Uh, so I said, right, I don't want to sort of kill the conversation here. So I said, uh, right, so, so I study chemistry. Uh, I do research in chemistry up at the university. She said, oh, right, okay. Oh, so you blow things up then. <laughs> um, and I tell this story because it actually happens a lot. Uh, either that or people say to me, oh, yeah, chemistry, yeah. Um, yeah, I was really bad at that. And either way, it's a real conversation killer, and it's sort of hard to come back from that. And it's a shame because normally when I get a bit further in conversation, I tell people actually about what I do do day to day. Normally I get people saying things like, uh, oh great, you know, I, I had no idea chemists did things like that. So I've thought a lot over the past few years about where this perception of chemistry has come from. You know, where has this idea come from that chemistry is, is dangerous and bad and all about explosions and toxins and poisons? And I think there's two problems. I think the first problem is us. Okay, because we, we have plenty of opportunities. You know, we have res responsibility as chemists to tell the world about what we do. And we have lots of opportunities. We go into schools or we go uh, in public fora like this. And we have this great chance to sort of tell the world about the amazing things that we do every day in our labs. And what do we do? We do this. which hopefully gets a few oohs, <laughs> and it's really beautiful, and it's fun. It captures the imagination, and it's actually really nice for, for example, uh, teaching uh, fundamental concepts like states of matter, or um, I'm really worried about it too much, so I'm going to break the glass now. <laughs> uh, states of matter or pH, it's really nice for teaching fundamental concepts of chemistry. But does that, that sort of steaming beaker, does that tell you anything about what I do as a chemist or what's actually going on in research and in industry, in chemistry around the world. Okay, and I think there's a real danger when chemists go out and do these sort of magic trick type experiments. If they do too many of them and don't link them to research, there's a real danger of trivializing the subject um, and taking away from some of the amazing things that chemistry does do. So, so I, said, I said there were two things that, uh, that I thought uh, impacted the perception of chemistry. I think the other one is, is historical. So, for example, who here has heard of thalidomide? Just hands up. Right, okay, how about CFCs? Ozone hole, yeah, pretty much everyone. How about Bhopal? That's quite a long time ago now, but still, yeah, big explosion in a, in a plant in India. Okay, so all, you know, cases where chemistry has gone horribly wrong. So maybe chemistry deserves its reputation. But I think the real danger um, and, and the real damage that these incidents have done to the, uh, the, the sort of perception of chemistry and the reputation of chemistry actually came from the fact that these incidents, none of these incidents were intentional. And you might think, well, yeah, that's obvious. You know, the guy that developed CFCs, you know, he didn't sit there rubbing his hands together thinking, yes, I'm going to destroy the ozone layer. Um, <laughs> and, you know, he didn't. Um, but, but the real danger is that that these people, you know, they, they didn't mean to do harm, but they actually, they had no concept, they had no idea that the things they were doing even could cause harm. Okay, so thalidomide, for example, caused all sorts of birth defect deaths in babies where the mother took the, uh, the medicine uh, to, to combat morning sickness. The company that developed thalidomide never meant for that to happen. They, in fact, did all sorts of safety tests before thalidomide was released. They, um, they found that you could, could give quite large amounts of thalidomide to a rat or a mouse without any apparent ill effects. Okay, so they thought, wow, this is great. You know, we found a drug that can help people and it seems really safe. CFCs is another example. CFCs were actually developed um, in the US to, uh, to be coolants, refrigerants, uh, and actually to replace things that were, were really dangerous, things like uh, ammonia, things like propane, that were known to cause explosions and that were known uh, to be toxic. Okay, so CFCs were developed and people thought, great, you know, we've, we've made this, you know, we've made people's lives better, we've made them safer. Okay, and so the real impact, I think, that 
all of these incidents have done to chemistry is trust, because how can, how can we expect the public to trust chemistry when we as chemists don't appear to have a handle on what we're doing? Okay, so I've started to think about, okay, so where has this come from, you know, and what, you know, where, where is this, uh, you know, where is this inability of chemists to sort of predict what their chemicals uh, do come from? Um, and I think it's a lot to do with education. So, you know, people go all over the world, people go to university to study chemistry, and generally we teach them, we teach them all sorts of things about atoms, about elements, compounds, we teach them about reactions, we teach them to say, take... Uh, a and B and react them together to make C. We teach them to think about, oh, how fast is that going to go? Can I make it faster? If I make C and I maybe do it, do I make just C or do I make a bit of D as well? And if I do make two compounds, how can I separate C from D and get rid of D as the sort of unwanted byproduct so I've got a nice pure compound? <laughs> but what we never teach or what we rarely teach students to think about is, should I make C? If I make C, and it you know, gets into someone's body, what might it do? What toxicological effects might it have? There are very few universities that teach toxicology to undergraduate chemists. We don't teach them to think about if C gets into the environment, what might it do? Might it accumulate in the food chain? Might it go into the atmosphere? If so, how long does it stay there? Will it degrade? We don't teach undergraduate chemists about environmental pathways of chemicals, or generally, many universities don't teach this. Okay, so how can we sort of, you know, prevent this and how can we change this in the future? And this is where this idea of green chemistry comes in. And green chemistry is a concept that basically says, well, let's try and think about chemistry in a different way. Let's try and do chemistry in a different way and think about all steps of our process and try and minimise or eliminate hazard in all of those steps. And that can involve, for example, uh, cutting down energy, uh, or it can involve uh, looking at the, the hazards of the, of, the, of the materials you use in the process or the, um, uh, the, the hazards of something that you make, okay? But the whole point of it is that you look at your whole process and you look at it from the start. So even before you start doing the chemistry, you start thinking about what you're making and what you're going to do with it. Okay, and so um, I thought I'd take this, you know, a couple of minutes just to, to sort of put that into context and, and sort of say a little bit about the research that we do and how that fits into green chemistry, hopefully as an example of, of what people are doing, you know, day to day in green chemistry. So what we actually do is look at nanomaterials. Okay, so there's obviously been a few things in the media and a few unhelpful things from Prince Charles about nanomaterials and nanorobots. But what we actually do, we don't just look at, we certainly don't look at nanorobots. Uh, we look at some uh, nanoparticles, but also we look at materials with sort of nanoscale properties. So very tiny features, structural features to them. For example, that could be holes through a material, so very porous materials. Again, there's lots of applications out there that have used these sort of nanoporous or nanostructured materials for many, many years. So for example, your catalytic converter in your car might have features inside it that are nanostructured or, or materials in a battery or an air filter, okay? So lots of applications where we need to make materials like this and also lots of future applications, things like fuel cells, for example. Okay, but the way we do this is to say, okay, well, hang on a second, nature actually has got a lot of these types of materials already. Okay, so for a, a seashell, for example, it's actually got a really beautiful tiny structure to it, or, or wood is a really lovely tiny structure of lots of long molecules of a, 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 a polymer, a long molecule called cellulose. These are all twisted together into fibres that give wood its really strong structure. Okay, so nature's really good at this already. And nature's got all sorts of resources that we as green chemists can use. And one advantage of using that, obviously, is, is you're using a renewable resource. So, you know, you can cut down trees and allow them to regrow, and maybe you can use that resource um, to make a material. And the other advantage, as a chemist, is that there's all sorts of things to play with. There's lots of interesting molecules to play with. And one molecule that we're particularly keen on is uh, alginate, which is a molecule that comes from seaweed. It's actually the molecule that makes seaweed. You know, when you pick up seaweed, it's got that really rubbery texture. Alginate's what does that. An alginate is basically a long molecule and it binds to calcium. It takes calcium out of the seawater and it forms these double helices. So a bit like DNA, you've probably seen DNA, alginate's quite similar really. And it forms these double helices with calcium down the middle. But it's actually not that fussy. I mean, it takes calcium from seawater because it needs some sort of metal and calcium's just there a lot in seawater. 
But if you want to give it some other metals, for example, it's perfectly happy to take those as well. It's really not fussy. So for example, if you took some yttrium, for example, it's an element right down the bottom of the periodic table, and you put that in with some alginate, again, it forms those double helices. So we've played with all sorts of different compounds and trying to make different compounds from these seaweed polymers. And one we tried to play with, and this is the relevance of the title, is a superconductor called yttrium barium copper oxide. Okay, so it contains yttrium, barium, and copper, a bit of oxygen as well. But it's the yttrium, the barium, copper that we're interested in. And we found that if you could take your yttrium, your barium, and your copper salts and chuck them in with the seaweed, your seaweed sits there, it forms its nice little coils around those metals, it organizes those metals in solution. So normally, if you try and make this yttrium, barium, copper oxide superconductor, and you grow it from solution that you, you, you heat it, and you grow these crystals of the superconductor, they form all sorts of different shapes and sizes, which isn't necessarily that useful. You can imagine if you want to make, say, I don't know, a circuit or something you know, with long, thin wires of a superconductor, you want nice, long, thin wires of the material. So we found that because the seaweed basically organizes how those ions, those metals, sit in the solution, it ties them up in those nice helices, basically the seaweed controls how the superconductor grows. So just by chucking a bit of seaweed in with some superconductor ingredients, we can get the superconductor to grow into little nanowires. And this is kind of the basis of all the research we do. It, that's just one tiny story, really. And we also do things like taking wood and making sort of nanostructured carbon materials for filters, for treating water, and for batteries, things like that. But the whole focus really is on taking interesting materials from nature and then sort of giving our sort of functional technological materials the properties um, that we need. So what's my take home message? Hopefully that'll just give you sort of one insight into a very small, narrow area, but you know, one little story within green chemistry. What's my take home message? I think the first thing um, is that we as chemists obviously we have a responsibility you know we need to go out there and we we need to do not just you know i mean the, the magic demos are fun but they're not necessarily going to tell the world about what we do okay and they, they risk sort of giving this image of chemistry as being about mysticism and magic i think the public can help a lot by maybe not uh just thinking oh chemical toxic ah but you know maybe taking an interest and, and thinking okay well, well maybe chemicals aren't all toxic um, and maybe looking more into that, and certainly the media can help on that front. But I think the real key has to come from education, because until we teach our university students to look at the broader impact of the chemicals that they make, so environmental impact, toxicology, then inevitably we are going to get another thalidomide, another Bhopal, or another case like CFCs. Green chemistry may be the road less travelled but it is the road we have to take. Thank you.